Good afternoon, violent community. Well, every story has a starting point, but this particular story has two starting points. Ground zero for the BYG actual label was this particular record, which I will get to in a moment. But for me, ground zero for the label it was a different story. And that was an amazing video that was filmed about four years ago, or maybe five years ago, by Derek Higgins, a violent community video that he recorded. Someone asked him to show showcase what he had on the B on the BYG actual label and he produced a remarkable video that I've returned to many times over the years as a well and a source of information and uh, thank you Derek if you're watching for that superb video I continue to to benefit and to reap the rewards from continuous viewing of it I even know when the dog is gonna bark in it that tells you how often I've watched it um, brilliant video so Derek was the direct inspiration for me to delve into this particular fascination that I have had over the past year and a half with, with this label. Um, the BYG, BYG was a French label uh, founded by three individuals, one with a surname B, one with a surname Y, and one with a surname G. Don't ask me to know to, to remember the names of the individuals, I can't. One of them had a kind of a Greek surname, and one of them, the Y, standard for young. Uh, there was another individual involved in that label, and he was Claude Del, Del Clou, who we'll come to in a moment. But getting back to the BYG story, BYG were a, a music label out of France, and they came up or chanced upon the idea of having a dedicated boutique sub-label called the Actual Series within the, BY, the greater BYG umbrella. Um, and the genesis for that was this particular concert, which was recorded live in Algier at the Pan-African Festival, a date at which Nina Simone appeared. It was attended by the president of Algeria, etc. Um, it was basically a festival which recorded and embraced African nationalism, Pan-African nationalism, Black American consciousness and North American tribalisms, etc. All those various tangents that all met together and coexisted um, at that heady time. It was, uh, it was quite a revolutionary time, the late 1960s. The BYG label Actuel series existed from between 1969 to 1971. There were a series of recordings recorded. Predominantly it was free jazz uh, recordings, but there were some prog, uh, there was some modern classical electronic avant-garde. Um, there was even some blues rock recorded for that label. Um, the seven individuals that played on Archie Shep's uh, recording, Archie Shep's led the Archie Shep led recording, um, which is very much ground zero, uh, went on in in their own way to become leaders of their own dates, and um, and it was highly nepotistic in that individuals from each other band each other's bands sat into other recordings uh, of the various artists. So, for example, Sonny Murray, the drummer on this particular date, led three or four sessions, and. Uh, Archie Shep would have sat in on some of them. The bassist Alan Silva had his own group. Um, Dave Burrell, the pianist, had his own group and went on to lead his own, um, uh, to be a leader on, on two dates on the BYG label. So uh, getting back to Del Clou. Well, Del Clou was the genesis behind all of this. He was the photographer and maybe, have, maybe was an editor as well for the Actuel magazine, which was bought by the BYG label. And he went to the Algerian festival to cover it. He convinced the BYG individuals to to um, set up a sub-label, if you like, and to record the music. And they promptly recorded the festival. Um, they didn't record the Nina Simone gig, but they did record the Archie Shep gig, and that went on to become Ground Zero. Now, this is not serious. This was not the first record that was released on the label. It was actually number fifty-one, as you can see, and. Subsequently, in 1971, the label folded because it had effectively bankrupted itself. It tried to hold a concert in in Paris in 1969, and literally what happened was a, the Parisian authorities wouldn't grant them a license, so they had to hold the concert in, in the town on the Belgian-French border, and that proved to be financial a financial disaster. Uh, the event itself was headlined by Pink Floyd and the MC was Frank Zappa and there were a number of, of 
prestigious acts performing at it, including all of the ones that appeared at the original Pan-African Festival. But it went on to be a financial disaster for the label and ended up being their death now. Um, so so that's it. So that's the starting point for me. As I said, there was two of them. And, uh, you know, the great thing about this label is the aesthetics of it. Um, I got really into it. I went on to actually create a spreadsheet of who played in the various dates, etc. So I got quite anal about it. Um, so uh, it's best now for me to go behind the camera so that you guys can appreciate the aesthetics of the actual label itself and the various Id Id idiosyncrasies of each one. Okay? There were approximately 52 recordings made on the BYG actual label. Two of them were recorded in Antibes, which is a town in France. One was recorded in Algeria at the um, Pan-African Festival performance, and one was recorded in Rome, that's uh, Steve Lacey's Moon, which was subsequently licensed to the BYG label. The artwork was typically very elegant and simple, as this one that I'm now showing will attest to. Typically, it reflected band members, which reflected, of course, the freedom that each of the groups were allowed in the recording process and the autonomy that was granted to them by the label. All 52 releases were gatefold with stock photography on the inside and full-size imagery of the artist at the back. Uh, the cover art took on three different sizes, a square image, a rectangular image and an almost full screen image uh, for the later issues. Most of them were predominantly shot in white or in cream colour, but there are some exceptions to this, such as the one by Gong and uh, Steve Lacey's Moon. Okay, it's definitely easier to show the, the splendour of their sleeves and the beautiful design aesthetics, um, featuring very simple numbering, the fact that all the consistency of the naming, that everything is in lowercase, both the artist's name and indeed the name of the album itself, Whereas on the inside, there it's all done in block capitals. All of the of these covers feature beautiful photography, uh, generally of the artists and performance. But here you can see Don Cherry just musing, um, but just stunning design. The beautiful uh, kind of soft linen color, creamy color of the textured sleeve with a kind of a gray border. Untypically, this one features. A kind of an artistic image it doesn't feature a photograph of the artist itself and that was quite kind of unique certainly from what I've seen of the, of the BYG collection generally in their canon it's uh, the photography is the image it was a very musician focused label and it makes sense that the photography in that case and all the artwork would focus on the individuals but this particular one is Don Cherry Mew first part it wasn't the first one recorded chronologically but it was the first one released obviously and this one is a duo featuring himself and Ed Blackwell. Uh, Cherry plays obviously pocket trumpet, but also piano and flutes. And um, this is a beautiful recording of quasi folk music, but also world music and some free jazz elements. So Don Cherry Mew, first part, and this is a first edition French issue. The second release that I have chronologically is Archie Shep's first date for the as studio leader for the label and this is called Yasmina a black woman this is actually well number four this is also a first French French pressing um, the image in the back is of himself and the drummer Sonny Williams at the Pan-African Festival uh, that image is used also as the cover image of one of Sonny Murray's releases which will come to subsequently and indeed on the inside the action photo photograph on the inside is of Archie Shep at the Pan-African Festival in Algier. Uh, this one is just a wonderful album. Um, I think he recorded three studio albums within a week for the label. This is the first one that was released chronologically, Yes Me Not Black Woman, and it, to my ears is the finest of the three that he recorded, although it does face stiff co competition from Blase, which I will come to in a moment. But the track Yes Me Not itself is just a magnificent, magnificent track. It may be the greatest track in all of the BYG canon. I certainly feel that it is, um, but a very strong release, Yes Mina, Black Woman, that's number four. Okay, I don't have number five, I have number six, and this is Claude Del Clou and Arthur Jones. This is kind of unusual as well in the sense that it it seems as if both names, I know Del Clou has got more prominence, but 
both artists seem to be getting more or less an equal billing there um, as opposed to Del Clue being identified as the leader. Um, he may have got the nod in naming rights because this guy Claude Del Clue was actually uh, the photographer and may even have been the editor for the actual magazine. This is number six in the series of BYG actual releases and it's definitely the most simple of, of, the, of the ones that have been released to date and of the ones that I have heard. Um, this very loose looking individual at the back with the really dodgy orange wrench in his hair is indeed Mr. Del Clue. Um, he is a drummer by trade but he's also a photographer as, as I alluded to and uh, he wrote and photographed for the actual magazine. This one as the title may suggest is it, it basically is about the confluence of African rhythms and Asian melody. Um, very simple music. Uh, it's my wife's favourite one on the label. Indeed, it's the only one on the label that she's prepared to listen to. It's a f you know, it's very easy music, but very hummable, and the melodies prevail long after the music is finished. Claude Delcu and Arthur Jones, African Asia, that's number six. Number eight, Burton Green Ensemble, Aquariana. Now, Burton Green, if I remember, did not play it at the festival at the pan-african festival he was a resident of paris and hooked up with the other members that recorded for byg in paris he is an american um pianist and this is more or less a conceptual piece uh, i found it difficult enough to warm to um and quite here here he's looking quite like an extra from the movie, maybe uh, the Planet of the Apes saga, except for that bottle of beer that's lurking there in the corner. So um, Burton Green Ensemble Aquariana, I think he's he's better works in the can than that one will attest to. Okay, this one certainly is a favourite of mine. This is Jimmy Lyons' Other Afternoons. Jimmy Lyons, um, he of the very Irish name, it's a very common name here, Lyons. This is actual number nine, and this I understand is his first date as leader. He was a member of the Cecil Taylor unit, um, as indeed were the other musicians on this one, Andrew Cyril, the drummer, and Alan Silva, the bassist. But he, he basically what this quartet does is that it swaps out uh, Lester Bowie in, instead of Cecil Taylor. Obviously, they don't play piano, but um, Bowie came in and from the Art Ensemble of Chicago, and Cecil Taylor was out. Now Taylor, I understand, was in Paris and in France for the recording sessions, but didn't actually contribute to any of the sessions or didn't sit in on any of them. But all the, all of the other members of his quartet did. And this is a, this is a fantastic date. I really enjoy this. The first track features some manic staccato drumming and a great bass solo. I think Cyril is the real star of this recording. Uh, he gives an outstanding turn, I think, on it. Um, side two is effectively one track uh, with the theme, sta the theme stated throughout and um, it's more bop than free jazz to be frank but it does have quite a, a wild bass solo, uh, a string bass solo so uh, definitely one to watch out for other afternoons. Okay moving on to the s number 11 release I have is Archie Shep's poem for Malcolm. This is the second Archie Shep uh, release as leader. Uh, this was recorded, I believe, a number of weeks after the assassination of Malcolm X. Um, side one features some spoken word, manic spoken word piece called Poem from Malcolm. And side two features kind of all, an almost ECM-like track called Rainforest Oleo. Um, yeah, side one is emotional spoken word poem if you like set to set to free music spiritual in parts and then side two features Archie Shep on piano and Philly Joe Jones on drums a uh, beautiful photograph there look at that look at the colors on that okay so that's his second release as band leader straight after then is number 12 Alan Silva and his Celestial Communication Orchestra now I'm not quite sure if that if there should be an R there because would it not mean Celestial Communication Anyway, this one is the bassist Alan Silva, and uh, we've spoken about earlier. Alan Silva, I think he was from the Caribbean. I initially thought that he was French, but he's not because then it would be Alan, A L A I N. But um, the cover image features a lovely image of him stooped over stand up bass, but 
he doesn't play bass actually on this this record bass is by Bob Guerin and Maliki Favors of Favors plays in the Art Ensemble of Chicago this one is quite cacophonous and very difficult to stick your teeth into um wow shocking case of dentures there look at that one yuck um anyway this one is kind of ballsy uh, tempestuous affair uh almost like punk jazz i will say and difficult enough to get into i must i must be frank i, I don't reach for this one too often and all of these by the way are all french originals so far this one um archie chef blase number 18 he's third and final i think release as leader on the label the third one recorded within seven days as well and this is blase and how about that for an image um this one features some female vocals now some of the other releases on this label also fe feature some female vocals we're going to come up to one in a moment as well to feature some female vocals but the title track blase is sung by this lady uh, Gian Lee in quite a soulful manner features some very questionable lyrics but um very strong album as well Blase and I have James Buttery to thank uh, because James introduced me to this album a while back when he did his his uh, Gimme 5 on Archie Shep um top top 3 Jamesy top 3 you know what I mean in, an inside rant there lads okay uh Jacques Cousil, uh, this is actually um, a Spanish reissue, as identified by the stereo marking on it, and the chronologically this was number 19, not number 8. This is called Way Ahead. This is the first of two releases that Jacques Cousil unit did on the BYG label. He's looking like a matador there. And uh, yeah, this doesn't really stand out. It's quite somber and moody. It's okay. Um, but this one's astonishing. Dave Burrell's Echo, the first of two albums that he released on this label. Now, he sat in many, many dates. I should have said earlier that Archie Shep was one of the most uh, prodigious uh, of recording. And as a session musician on the label, well, this guy was too. He sat in on a huge amount of dates. The pianist Dave Burrell, Echo. Uh, the first, this has got a fierce reputation. Um, but the first track... Even though it's a, it's an ensemble, balls out, freaky performance, it somehow just stays together the whole time, and just a magnificent, really really magnificent album. Um, side two is a lot more somber. The track piece, as the name might may suggest, but uh, as an ensemble piece, it doesn't get more frantic than the first track here, the title track, Echo. I have to say, just an absolutely astonishing album and my favourite on the label, Dave Burrell Echo. Okay, next is, oh, I don't know how to pronounce this guy's surname, but um, Kenneth Tarode, called Love Rejoice. This is number 22, um, features two tracks. One is called Love, one is called Rejoice. Uh, wrong, I'm, I'm wrong. One is called Blessing and the second track is called... Uh, Love Rejoice, so that's my affected uh, anime moment for this video. Some beautiful stock photography again. Um, my initial impression of this one was that it was okay as well. Um, some spiritual moments, but it's just uh, it's free jazz, but nothing spectacular here. This one I, I think is excellent. Clifford Thornton, Kachawa, this is number 23. Now Clifford Thornton played at, at the Algier Pan-African Festival, and this... This name, Kachawa, refers to the mosque uh, in Algier, which was very close to where the performance took place. Um, and he appeared with the same septet as appears on Archie Shep's Live at Pan-African Festival. Uh, this is an album of two faces. Side one is a ballsy, all-in, high-tempo, almost freak-out, intense, but not as fierce as his reputation as well. But side two is much more restrained. Um, features lovely ascending and descending piano lines. I remember that from it. Um, Kachow, uh, Thornton himself was the son of a revolutionary factory worker. He studied music for 13 years and then went on to be a member of the US Army Band. So that's definitely wor worth checking out. Um, these guys, Art Ensemble of Chicago, released I think three or four on the actual series as well. This is Reese and the Smooth Ones. Um, 
this one features two tracks of the same name and the same duration, lending me initially to believe that they were the same track, but they're not. Um, they're both called Reese and the Smooth Ones, and they both last 20 minutes, 30 seconds each, but both tracks are completely different. The side one track, Reese, is kind of more in there, out there music, if you know what I mean, whereas side two is a much more uh, rumbunctious number. Um, these guys did not perform at the Pan-African Festival, but some of the band members feature and step in on many dates on the label. I know that Maliki Favors, Lester Bowie and Roscoe Mitchell featured on many of and sat in on many of the dates that were subsequently recorded. Um, they were in Paris, they were resident of Paris before the actual performance took place in Algiers. And uh, they met with the members who had performed at Archie Shep's Septet date subsequent to the actual festival itself. Okay, uh, next is Dave Burrell, uh, La, Vie en, La Vie de Bohème. This is number 30, and this is also an original French pressing. And this is a reimagine, reimagination of Puccini's opera La Vie de Bohème. Um, I felt compelled to buy this because I was so impressed by Dave Burrell's Echo. This is completely different. And how about that for, for an almost sunrise image of Mr. Burrell himself? Um, this is kind of spectral in parts, features some harp, some freaky violin, and some really creepy female vocalizations by, I think it was his wife. Um, but yeah, th this is, not, not as good as Echo, but certainly very different uh, borders on chamber music almost at times, but then goes into free fall again with some lovely free moments. There's a great drum roll on, drum solo rather, on the second act, uh, which is the first track on side two, but well worth checking out. Okay, the next one, uh, Frank Wright, with the image that I prefer most of all on this label. This is called One for John and I think this is the only recording that he did on actual this is number 36 uh, the cover would lead you to believe that it's quite spiritual this one features two long tracks the first one's got some really dynamic drumming by Muhammad Ali but not the boxer sadly although I'd say he was well able to punch some drums and some skins in his time um, the bass drum actually gets some serious work out on, on that particular track and there's some Leon Thomas like vocalizations going on at the end of the of the track one for John. A track two is very Asian sounding as you can imagine. It's called China Part Two. It's actually split because the first six minutes of it appear on side one. And that track was penned by the bassist called Bobby Bobby Few. So um yeah, that's a decent recording, I must say. Um not one of the not certainly not in the in the top five, but just outside outside that category, I think. Okay, uh Sonny Murray recorded a number of releases as leader, and here he is in that very same image that I showed earlier on with himself and Archie Shep at the Pan African Festival. This is number forty eight. This is called Sunshine. He also released Homage to Africa and he released Never Give a Sucker an Easy Break. Uh the track Sunshine I definitely have heard before, and I've certainly heard the riff from Red Cross. That track definitely I, I had had heard of before. The opening track, Flower Train, is just magnificent. And this is one of the best albums on the label, I think. Really enjoyed that. And there is Sonny Murray, the frantic drummer himself, looking very much like a matador again. Some of these guys, uh, they look like him. And there he is in a frenzy. Great photo. Um, yeah, that track Flower Chain is definitely worth Flower Train is definitely worth checking out. And uh, unusually, the lyric, uh, the description here is in English because uh, they tend they were all French before, but this is a French pressing. This is Sonny Murray's Sunshine. He's not he's not a drummer to keep time. He's a drummer to create kind of a textured sound as opposed to uh, timing. Okay, and then on to the one that started it all off. This was recorded by BYG, um, by the label BYG, by their engineers at Pan-African Festival. Uh, the date that kicks the whole thing off, held in Algier, 
Uh, Nina Simone played at the same festival, although she didn't join this recording. This is the Septet recording, uh, number 51, f uh, featuring Archie Shep. Now, he did two other live recordings for the label, Live at Antibes, Volume 1 and Volume 2. And as the front image and as the name would suggest, this is kind of a communion of um black consciousness american jazz and indeed north african tribal music um features two tracks brotherhood kachawa and we have come back part one and part two that indeed is quite a spiritual track uh, it features some spoken word elements as well and um yeah that's all there is to say about it definitely worth checking out and uh look at there's an exalted uh Sonny Murray, how about that for an image? He's really feeling the moment. He has certainly come back, hasn't he? Um, and look at the starch pants of Mr. Silva. Okay, the final release I have on the label is actually a, re a compilation, rather, and this is two releases by the trombonist Kraken Monker III. This is New Africa, and also the release One Morning I Waked Up Very Early. This is actual number 205, so it's not obviously an original issue of those releases um and these are the two albums in question there is a number of 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 similar albums like this i know the art ensemble chicago there's a release like this and indeed sonny murray's two albums uh that i don't have are on this reissue package as well and that's my lot vc i hope you guys uh, enjoyed this video and thanks for watching everyone